Okay. <laughs> well, welcome everyone to the Fishtails Lecture Series again, where we present the science of Great Lakes fisheries. We got a really cool presentation tonight. You're going to enjoy it very much. But I also really want to remind you of the last Fishtails Lecture Series, which is going to be on April 27th. It's going to be Dr. Nicole uh, Neatlisbach. She's the veterinarian for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, at least one of them. And she'll talk about largemouth bass virus and the smallmouth bass in Green Bay. You know, it just recently in the last, well, I don't know how many years ago, but um, the largemouth bass virus has been found in smallmouth bass in Green Bay and in Green Bay. And it, you know, down south with largemouth bass in some areas, it really is almost like a cold issue. I mean, it kills a bunch of fish. So exactly how that's going to be expressed up here, I don't know that anybody really knows, but the person that probably knows as much as anybody is Nicole. Uh, you know, and sometimes you catch fish with lesions on them and so on. What do you do? What's safe? What's the DNR recommendation for handling those fish and that kind of stuff. So it'll be a really good one to end the season on, on uh, April 27th. And I assume all those folks uh, joining us via Zoom um, that you've read the housekeeping details. Um, and please, uh, you know, stay on mute until the end. If you have a question, you can... Uh, Put it in chat, but then we'll unmute people at the end and you can just ask it directly too. Oops. Let's do this last time too. It's not forwarding. There we go. Okay. So tonight, we have Daniel Zielinski, who is a principal engineer and scientist with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. He received his bachelor's degree in civil engineering at UW-Wisconsin Platteville and a master's and PhD uh, at the University of Minnesota with emphasis on water resources. He's authored numerous publications examining behavioral responses of fish to acoustic and hydrodynamic stimuli and the integration of this data into numerical models. Sounds kind of involved, doesn't it? <laughs> um, he is broadly interested in integrating engineering and biological principles to better understand how the aquatic environment influences physical and behavioral responses in fish, and has built a research approach focused on exploiting computational resources. That's a lot of math. <laughs> uh, and experimental technology to enhance fish passage and invasive species control. He has been the project lead for the Great Lakes Fish. Commission's Binational Selective Fish Passage Project, or called Fish Pass, since 2016. He's currently stationed at Traverse City, where he works closely with all the project partners involved in Fish Pass, and it's one of the uh, more broad partnered projects probably in the Great Lakes, because multiple disciplines and lots of different interests, and I won't get into He told me all them all at at supper tonight, and uh, it's about what I expected for a good Great Lakes Fish Commission project. They're really good at getting consensus and bringing everybody together. You know, across the bay, uh, Rob Elliott, who's here today, has has worked on the, the fish lift for sturgeon there um, to get it over the Park Mill and Menominee dams, and it, it works. And, and the whole purpose is to try to reconnect, you know, as much of the Menominee River to the bay uh, as possible. Uh, because it helps with the integrity of the fishery and it opens up more spawning area because below the dams uh, on the Menominee, there really isn't a lot of spawning area for sturgeon. But it's also manpower intensive. And so the ideal is to create something that's more volitional. And that's important for all the tributaries around the Great Lakes uh, because there are very few uh, sort of large or major river systems that are not impeded somewhere by a dam. Um, but you have um, issues of passing too many fish. Anyway, that sort of sets it up because um, the, the, the showcase in the Great Lakes right now uh, addressing these fish passage issues is the Fish Pass Project. So everybody, welcome Dan Zielinski. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, you kind of gave away the short and long of my talk, so I don't know. Uh, we'll have a, a quiz at the end. 
All right, so as mentioned, my name is Dan Salinci. I'm principal engineer and scientist with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission and project lead on Fish Pass, uh, and I'm stationed in Traverse City, Michigan. Uh, so this project is taking place on the Boardman Ottaway River. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is the culmination of over seven years of planning, design, research uh, that's been contributed by a group of, at this point, well north of 120 biologists, scientists, engineers, managers, um, with expertise in fish passage, sea lamp break control, uh, and engineering. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge all of our project partners, which are shown on screen on the left-hand side here. Yeah, left-hand side. Uh, as well as our primary project funders in the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, the City of Traverse City, the State of Michigan, Great Lakes Fishery Trust, and the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. So today I'm going to talk primarily about or I'm going to introduce the concept of the connectivity conundrum facing barriers on in fragmented watersheds around the world. And then also kind of focus primarily on how that is being played out on the Boardman River and how Fish Pass seeks to solve that connectivity conundrum through developing tools and techniques to selectively pass desirable fish while blocking or uh, removing undesirable and often invasive species. So connectivity is really important for a lot of fish history traits uh, because they need to be able to move within rivers or between rivers and the receiving waters uh, to uh, complete their life cycle. Um, and connectivity in watersheds is also important just for general watershed, uh, watershed health. However, barriers in the form of dams and road crossings block that connectivity. Uh, looking worldwide, we see that about 60% of the world's rivers have at least one large dam. On. And if we focus just on the Great Lakes, we know that there's a network of over 260,000 barriers that block movement of upwards of 120 species that we know have migratory movements within rivers or between rivers and lakes. Now, dam removal or barrier removal is a recognizable solution to this issue. However, it can have unintended, it can have both desirable and undesirable consequences. And this is especially true when there's the presence of invasive species. So this is kind of that, that the, this brings rise to the connectivity conundrum. So it's the tension between improving passage for desirable species while decreasing or eliminating passage by invasive or undesirable species. And the Great Lakes Fishery Commission in this project is, is seeking to essentially establish selective connectivity uh, as a way to provide a solution to that connectivity conundrum. So here to illustrate what this looks like, um, when we start with the situation of no connectivity, this is where you have a barrier on a system. So fish, sediments, and nutrients that are trapped upstream stay there. Uh, and vice versa, you have invasive species, native fish, and nutrients that they might be carrying stuck downstream of the dam. In the situation where we have full connectivity, we've removed the barrier, and now we have free movement of fish nutrients downstream, as well as fish and nutrients back upstream. But when we have the presence of invasive species, which weren't there when the dams were first in place, uh, you're not really establishing uh, the status quo. So what we propose is a selective connectivity scenario where we selectively pass desirable species both up and downstream while blocking those that are undesirable. And when we talk about invasive species in the Great Lakes, while there are numerous invasive species, arguably none has been more detrimental to the fish community than the sea lamprey. This is an invasive species that's native to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it has runs on the East Coast of the United States, as well as in the UK and, and Portugal. Uh, they gained access to the Great Lakes at the turn of the century with the construction of the Welland Canal and Erie Canal, which allowed them to bypass natural barriers like Niagara Falls. And once they established, uh, they contributed to the near collapse and uh, extirpation of Lake Whitefish and Lake Trout in the Great Lakes. Um, in response to this fishery collapse, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission uh, was, was formed and tasked with, among other things, uh, to be able to coordinate and manage a sea lamprey control program. Uh, this program focuses on targeting sea lamprey reproduction and early life stages for control. So sea lamprey adults feed on uh, the bodily fluids and blood of fish out in the Great Lakes. Once they cease feeding, they start the maturation process, move into tributaries where they spawn, and their larvae will stay there for anywhere between three to five years in general, and where they are generally filter feeders. But eventually they will metamorphose and move back on downstream and go back to feeding 
on uh, fish out in the Great Lakes. So that control program focuses on using uh, lamprosides and barriers to control sea lamprey. Lamprosides are uh, near species specific chemicals that kill uh, sea lamprey larvae in tributaries. Uh, and then we have barriers which prevent adults from reaching that high quality spawning habitat, again, reducing the likelihood of them to reproduce, and also has the added benefit of reducing the amount of lamprosides that are needed to treat uh, areas that have sea lamprey larvae. Now combined, these have reduced populations of sea lamprey in the Great Lakes to less than 90% of their historic peak. However, the same barriers that block sea lamprey also block almost all native species uh, in the Great Lakes. And when we talk about just the first, first barrier in a system, uh, that count gets up to 460 barriers uh, in the Great Lakes alone. So that's obviously a problem in that those barriers are blocking native species from reaching critical spawning habitat, but we still need them to be able to control sea lamprey. So that brings the Great Lakes Fishery Commission into the, the picture of trying to find ways to selectively pass those native fish while blocking undesirable and invasive sea lamprey. And this will be carried out on the Boardman Ottawa River. Now, before the fish pass kind of came to it, it came to the Boardman River, the Boardman River was the focus of a multi-year, multi-agency restoration initiative in which it removed three upstream dams, the Sabin Dam, Boardman Dam, and Brown Bridge Dam, and sought to modify the lowermost, ban, lowermost dam, which is the Union Street Dam. Now, these dam removals greatly improved habitat and conductivity in the upper watershed. However, it left the system open to sea lamprey access because now instead of a system that has four redundant barriers, there's only one. And historically, the, the Union Street Dam has had some passages of sea lamprey. So the, all the agencies involved with Borden River restoration essentially were, were stuck with this Union Street Dam and needed to find a solution to be able to selectively pass fish so that we could restore connection between the Borden River and its receiving water, Lake Michigan while the Great Lakes Fishery Commission was looking for a site to be able to develop fish pass. And this alignment of goals led to the partnering with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission and hence fish pass taking place at the Union Street Dam. So uh, before I get into the details of fish pass, I do wanna point out you know, what the existing dam looks like. It's an earthen embankment structure that's got a number of culverts that kind of disappear the water underneath the earth and it discharges down here. It's got two spillways, one here, one kind of hidden in the trees. And then there's this uh, fishway that has been decommissioned since uh, 2018 uh, because there was uh, a consensus from the community, Michigan DNR and tribe to prevent passage of non-native salmonids upstream into that newly re rehabilitated habitat, at least for a certain period of time. Uh, but that fishway was really only effective at passing Pacific salmonids. Uh, so now species were able to pass and there was also uh, a history of sea lion prey escapement. So you can see that uh, the proposed design of fish pass on the right-hand side here, or your left-hand side, uh, is a quite a dramatic change to the site. Uh, in essence, fish pass will replace the Union Street Dam with an improved barrier with selective fish passage capabilities. Uh, once constructed, we will optimize various sorting technologies, essentially below a barrier, and during that time, the site will be developed into a living laboratory with strong academic research and community education programs. And once we've identified what the ideal suite of uh, sorting tools that work for the fish community of the Borden River, we will convert it to a permanent selected fishway and then start to export the process to other barriers. And it's really the process where we come to decide what those tools are is what's been exported, not necessarily a structure quite this large everywhere. <laughs> So in this image, uh, it kind of shows you the, the broad overview of what fish pass is. And you can see there's a lot of different elements. I would love to go in detail on what every single one of these circles points out because there was numerous meetings and lot, lots of involvement with the community and designers to, I, to come up with all this, but I'm just gonna focus tonight on two of the main features and that's kind of what's in the river. First, I'll start with the, the fish sorting channel. So that's this channel right here on the, on the lower portion of the the image. This is where most of the selective passage research will take place and it was designed for adaptability in mind. So it's essentially a 400 foot long, 30 foot wide concrete flume. 
Um, it has anchorage points about every two feet uh, in pretty much every direction along the floor and on the walls to be able to install and move around different sorting tools. Uh, it also has a removable wooden partition so that we can split this down into uh, two 15 foot wide channels or leave it as one 30 foot channel uh, or possibly some, some variation of that. And we also have a gantry crane to be able to move those, those different tools around quickly. And there will be an automated data carriage that allows us to measure what the environmental conditions are within the channel uh, in a very repeatable and, and uh, precise manner. And controlling flow into this channel is uh, a dual headgate system at the upstream end. So we're able to control the amount of water that's going through the fish sorting channel, uh, speed and depth while still maintaining a barrier at the upstream end so that we don't have any uncontrolled or unintended passages of fish. On the opposite side of the channel is the Nature Life Bypass Channel. So that's this strip, stretch right here. Uh, this, in, in contrast to the fish sorting channel is very natural. It's gonna look a lot like a lot of the restored stretches of river upstream. It's designed primarily to pass most of the river flows as well as all the flood, uh, regulatory flood flows. And it features uh, increased habitat in stream. So there's riffle habitat, there's a engineered log jam, as well as over 500 feet of uh, vegetated shoreline. Uh, and controlling flow into the bypass channel is this kind of unique looking structure here, which is called an arc labyrinth weir. Uh, what's special about this is it was selected because it can pass a lot of water without taking up a lot of space. As you can imagine, this project is taking place in, in a downtown area. There's, there's very large buildings and condos on both sides of the river. So we're really tight on space. Um, so being able to have a, a structure that can efficiently pass up to a 200 year storm is, is really critical. And not only that, but it does so very safely. So it, it doesn't generate the kind of dangerous recirculation that can happen downstream of dams uh, that can trap people or, or boats that may be in the water up against the, the face of the dam. So it doesn't generate dangerous conditions. Uh, and really this bifurcated channel design was selected because this is a popular river. There's a lot of people that will canoe and kayak through here. Uh, it's also a popular fishing spot because of course it's lowermost dam, so that's where all the fish back up. And being able to maintain use of the river for public use and recreational use as well as research without with and minimizing any complications from that uh, was really critical. So that's why we have that bifurcated uh, design. And of course, there's a lot of other features here that I'm not talking about, um, but overall, it really enhances the site uh, and uh, increases the, the usefulness of the site uh, for the, the community. So with all those additional features, there's obviously a lot of project goals that we have in place. And obvious ones are invasive species control and fish passage, and I'll get into that very shortly. Uh, but I do also want to touch on uh, the other ecological goals, one being uh, wanting to maintain a natural aesthetic. Uh, that was really uh, a strong comment from the community, as well as needing to be able to pass the regulatory flood flows and improve water quality. And we're doing that through uh, the, a decrease in impermeable surfaces, installation of rain gardens, as well as a green roof on our research and education building. In terms of recreational goals, uh, obviously we want to improve access across, uh, across the site and through the site. So all the, all the pathways in orange there are all ADA compliant, uh, so people can get north, south, east, west through the project, also get access to the river. Uh, we have a kayak slide as well as ADA compliant boat ramps on both up and downstream side of the project. And then finally, educationally, uh, certainly the project needs to be incorporated into the, the city's master plan. Uh, and we also enhance public engagement and education through uh, directed curriculum that will be developed in the future as well as we have opportunities to be able to engage with the scientists that would be doing work at Fish Pass. And we have signage that's designed so that uh, people can kind of do their own self-guided tour uh, throughout the site, uh, focusing on not just the research that's happening at Fish Pass, but also the Portland River history. So kind of backing up to those biological goals, we really focus on two. Um, the first one being no sea lamprey production requiring treatment of lamprecytes upstream of the project site. This is a pretty obvious one because of how fecund sea lamprey are. That really means we can only tolerate the passage of one individual. So essentially zero passage of sea lamprey. On the other hand, uh, we wanna be able to increase fishery production in the Borgen River to a level that's comparable to other tributaries and streams. Now simply passing fish past a barrier that's been in place for the last hundred years 
on its own is not necessarily going to contribute to fishery production because there's a lot of other factors that go into play. There's a, a natural lake that's upstream of here. Uh, and there's also the fact that a lot of these fish haven't been able to pass upstream past this site for a number of years. So uh, we very loosely have a, a kind of a vague goal in just being able to broadly in, increase fishery production. Now, before I get into details on how we actually plan to selectively sort fish, uh, I do want to focus on some of the kind of main design features of, of fish pass. The first one being that one of the basis for the design is that it had to be an improved barrier. And, you might, and that might seem like an odd uh, criteria considering this is a fish passage project, but if you think about it, you can't really control passage if fish are able to pass through the barrier in an un, uncontrolled or unintended way. Uh, and really this, this part of the design focuses on two species primarily. First is sea lamprey for obvious reasons, um, because if they escape, that requires expensive treatment and we don't want to have that. Um, and the design that we need to follow for that is, is pretty straightforward. There's 60, over 60 years of experience on designing sea lamprey bears. And we know as long as we maintain an 18 inch differential between the, the top of whatever is passing water to the lower water level, they will be able to be unable to pass volitionally over the barrier. Um, on the other end though, we also need to be able to prevent the passage of introduced salmonids. Um, so as I mentioned before, there's community desire to not allow passage of uh, primarily rainbow trout steelhead to make it upstream. And this is a challenge because these are obviously very strong swimmers and can leap you know, one to two meters out of the water very easily. So we needed to take kind of a different approach to, to designing the structure so that we can make sure that there's no unintended passage of, of steelhead. And this was really done by capturing a lot of in situ data. So we have the working with researchers from Central Michigan University to look at recordings of steelhead jumping at the existing barrier. So we can calculate one, the leaping speed, the direction, uh, and, and also kind of taking in information from existing studies out, out west where they're native. Uh, and then being able to integrate that with some projectile motion analysis and high resolution flow models. So that's kind of what you see in the upper right hand corner there, or upper left hand corner, uh, in which we could look at a finite number of different locations where they could potentially pass and identify what discharges in the river would provide conditions in which steelhead uh, could potentially pass. And when we compare that, those results all back to historic records of flow in the Borden River. Uh, so in the blue here is, that is the historic record of flows in the river. And essentially what we determined through this analysis was that at around five year flood, this is what would trigger kind of increased monitoring of the site, primarily through uh, surveillance uh, data and potentially even uh, some short-term surveys upstream. Uh, and then we expect that steelhead are gonna be blocked at the site up to about a 25 year flood. And that's significant for this condition or for this site because you can see in the past 70 years, uh, we haven't really had a flow that even got to the same level of a 25 year flood. Now, obviously, based on probabilities, that doesn't mean that couldn't happen next year, uh, but it is a, quite a low frequency in this system. And then, of course, sea lamprey would be blocked up to a 100 year flood event, which makes this primarily, this would make this the most kind of robust sea lamprey barrier in the Great Lakes Basin. So now that we've established that uh, we can control for unintended passage, now we work on how are we actually going to sort fish and how does it operate uh, in general? So as I mentioned before, a lot of the structures were designed for adaptability in mind. We wanted to be able to kind of change how the structure operated to facilitate fish making their own decisions and volitionally pass. So kind of using that engineering design to exploit behavior. So uh, manipulating how much flow is going down either side of the channels, uh, this is kind of that attraction flow to divert fish one way or the other, having the ability to install different habitat and movement modifiers. Um, and all this is done through that partition wall, dual head gates, multiple attachment anchors, as well as an entrance pad that allows us to kind of work before fish even enter the fish sorting channel. Uh, and the way it operates that we have two basic operational conditions. The first is kind of this normal operation. So this uh, shows water flowing from right to left in the black arrows, and then fish movement upstream would be from left to right on that red line. Uh, so in this situation, essentially the river split in two, half of it goes down the fish sorting channel, half of it goes down the nature like bypass. At the upstream end of the nature like bypass is a barrier, it's a dead end. There might be some traps here so we could still work on collecting fish, but essentially it's 
no change from current conditions. Uh, but where the passage could occur uh, in controlled fashion is in fish sorting channels. So this is where fish would encounter those different tools and technologies that I'll get into a little bit later. <clears throat> Alternatively, we have a situation where now instead of fish having to make a decision at that entrance pad, every fish would go down the nature like bypass. Uh, we close a gate at the downstream end of the fish sorting channel. So now water is actually going kind of in a serpentine fashion and exiting over here where we have gates where we can allow fish to enter uh, into the fish sorting channel. And really, this, this design kind of mimics some of the fishways you might see out west, on which they're kind of perpendicular to the, to the river flow. Uh, and really, it's just a, a way to hedge our bets in which that we want to increase the amount that fish will encounter these tools and technologies so that we can effectively sort them. And when we talk about how we're actually going to do the sorting, um, selective passage really boils down to a very simple question. It's how to sort an assortment of things. Um, and there aren't a lot of examples of this from the natural resources, but we did derive some inspiration from a fairly disparate field, and that's material recycling. Uh, you may be thinking to yourself, that seems like a really odd analogy. Uh, but if you think about it in, in material recycling, you're really just trying to sort out desirable materials while kicking out anything that's not desirable. So in this case, we want to actually develop a system that has a framework that's based on single stream recycling, where innovation is centered on automation and attribute-driven sorting. And the attribute-driven sorting is, is what's key. Uh, but even just the onset of material recycling in the 60s and 70s is very similar to what we see for selective passage or needs for selective passage now. So really the drive for material recycling was uh, driven primarily by just environmental awareness of what's happening with all the waste products that people produce. Very similar, you know, people are now becoming more and more aware of what's happening with or the impacts of barriers in, in watersheds and wanting to remove those barriers. Uh, initial material recycling was done by manual sorting, really labor intensive. Similar case here where the only way we can selectively pass fish currently is manual trap and sort, which is obviously labor intensive. And if it causes any delay to the fish can be very harmful to them. Um, but finally, you know, material recycling kind of came to its own when it developed, when it saw kind of a, a spike in technological innovation and then attribute driven sorting. So single stream recycling is different from just general material recycling because in material recycling, uh, in its infancy, you know, people had to separate their materials into separate bins and went off to different locations for processing. However, single stream recycling is what you may recognize today. And that's where you put all your, mater all your recyclable materials into a single bin somebody else picks it up and brings it to a facility to be able to be sorted. And that's kind of what we want to follow here. And, and when it gets brought to these facilities, you get a process that looks kind of what you see on the bottom of the screen here, where they piece through different attributes of the material. So they don't just pull out cardboard because it's cardboard. They don't pull out paper because it's paper. They don't pull out metal because it's metal. They focus on the attributes of those materials. So whether it be shape, size, density, color, um, reflect, you know, it's it, how much it reflects light, they use x-rays or magnets to be able to pull out metals. Uh, and it's that same kind of process that we want to apply to fish sorting. So when we look at the main steps of single stream recycling, it actually even mimics what we anticipate for selective fish passage processes. So at the first step, you have kind of that collection. So that's in the recycling industry, you have a uh, truck that collects all the materials, brings it to the site. We don't need a truck in this case because the river and fish function as our conveyor belt. They're going to migrate into rivers on their own volition due to whatever environmental cues is important for each species. So they're kind of moving themselves in. At the second step, this is kind of our first uh, opportunity to instigate some level of sorting. So in the case of fish pass, that's directing fish either towards a dead end or into the fish passageway to be sorted. And then obviously, once they're in the fish sorting channel, that's where we're actually doing that sorting process. And this is really done through uh, processes that can be both uh, positive or negative. Positive sorting meaning you're targeting your desirable fish, and negative meaning you're targeting your undesirable fish. And differentiating between those two types of processes is important when you think about when different proportions of fish come in. So if you have a process that's really targeted to collecting, say, sea lamprey, if you have a thousand suckers coming in and only four sea lamprey, that's a really effective tool to use. But if you have a tool that has to be able to identify and pick out each sucker, then it becomes much more difficult. So you can see how that's important. Uh, and then these, these sorting tools can also be direct or indirect. 
direct meaning it's, it's physically sorting the fish. And that, an example of this would be screens. They actively sort fish based on size. Um, whereas indirect might be something like image recognition. So you identify the fish, but it doesn't actually sort them. You have to rely on some other tool or gate to move or, or trapping to happen to actually separate that fish. Um, and then finally, the last step is fate. So this is what happens to the fish. What's the condition of the fish and how do they contribute to the population upstream or not? Um, in some cases, uh, one of the drawbacks of, of fishways is that fish use up so much energy to get up them. Once they make the upstream end, they just drop back on downstream. So we want to make sure that what we're passing is actually able to complete its life, life uh, history. So when we talk about the traits that we're going to focus on for fish passage, we really rely on phenology, morphology, behavior, and physiology. And there's a lot of tools that have been developed to target these types of attributes um, over the past 50 or 60 years, just in sea lamprey, and you know, much longer than that for just general fish passage. And really what fish pass provides is an opportunity to integrate all those for the first time. So focusing on phenology, this is really the run timing of fish. Like I mentioned before, fish will enter a river system at different times of year uh, and different times of day. And understanding those differences can help so help uh, drive what types of tools you'll use and when. Uh, and, and this is already used in the Great Lakes uh, in, the, in the form of seasonal barriers or seasonal traps like shown here, uh, in which it's only in operation when sea lamprey are running. Unfortunately, sea lamprey runtimes overlap with most of our native fish, so it's, it's clearly not a universal solution. So then moving on to morphology, this is so sorting fish by size or shape. Screens and traps are already used to effectively sort fish by size, but here's also where we can introduce new technologies like image recognition to identify fish based on their, their fin shape, eye position, color, uh, ways that they move through the water. Uh, and I'll, I'll give an example of that a little bit later. Uh, the next trait is behavior. This is the one that differentiates the most from material cycling because fish are not inanimate objects. They have volition, they can respond to their environment. Um, and, and what we want to use with behavior is essentially we want to effectively drive fish to, set, to sort themselves. Um, so that's understanding their responses to bubble, light, sounds, or, or specific chemicals. And, and in this example, this is an alarm cue that's being applied to a tank full of lamprey. And you'll see there's quite a strong response. Mm -hmm. They really don't like it. And that alarm cue is really just an extract from dead lamprey. You know, they've evolved a, a response to know when they, they can smell when there's dead lamprey and they want to avoid it. So you could envision if you could apply that to say the fish sorting channel, uh, you'd effectively, you know, prevent a lot of sea lamprey from making their way in. Um, finally, we have physiology, which is just their physical ability to overcome a challenge. So whether that be a leaping challenge, swimming against high velocities, or in the case of these eel style ladders, uh, sea lamprey can actually make it up that, but pretty much every fin fish we have in the Great Lakes cannot. So it's this is an example of where one's being used in a sea lamprey trap. So in, in this uh, brief example is kind of a hypothetical situation of how this might play out at, at fish pass. So you have an assortment of fish coming up. You might start by sorting by size, because um, again, trying to sort a really large sturgeon and small perch is kind of difficult. Um, you might use then image recognition to be able to trigger a door from opening. You can sort by their ability, leaping ability or swimming ability, responses to environmental cues like sound, bubbles, lights. Uh, you can even target the position that fish swim in the water column and pairing those all with traps to effectively collect the fish and direct them towards either passage or removal or just re returning back downstream of the barrier. So you might be asking, well, how do you even start with all those different traits? How do you actually decide on what to use? And I don't expect you to read this because I can't even read this. Uh, but essentially what this is, is showing is, is a project that we have going on with a researcher from the University of Toronto to do what's called a guild analysis. And essentially what we generated was a list of all, each one of these lines is uh, a native and non-native fish in the Great Lakes that we know to have migratory movements. So I think the list is about 240 fish or so. Uh, and we can, uh, we uh, populated a data table essentially of all the, the kind of relevant fish passage attributes that we could generate for this number of fish. 
Um, I think it, it totaled up to about 40 different attributes and things like, you know, when do they move, uh, eye position, fin size, you know, kind of as, as a uh, proxy for swimming ability. Um, also, you know, their hearing ability, whether they school or not, have electroreceptors. And essentially what the skill analysis does is it groups those fish based on either commonalities or differences among those traits. And this is just kind of the first cut of, of what's been done because it's still pretty early on in this process. And what you see is you know, we get these, these five kind of main clusters where we have sea lamprey, suckers, walleye, a lot of our kind of large high trophic level fish uh, in this kind of green area. We have some cyprinid, so fish that have specialized hearing that are relatively small or kind of lower on the trophic level. In these two clusters, in cluster four, this is pretty much all your introduced salmonids. Uh, so coho, chinook, steelhead, and then category five is kind of generally smaller, understudied uh, minnows and, 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 and the like. Um, now, we still need to be able to sort in within each of these clusters, but this kind of gives you an idea of where we might identify some of those attributes that we can target for sorting. And the way we would decide what tools to use or what attributes to focus on uh, is driven by our advisory board. So this is a board that's made up of uh, representatives from all of our project agencies, uh, our partner agencies, as well as a science team that has uh, approximately about 20 experts in fish biology, fish behavior, fish passage, engineering. Um, and their main goal, once fish pass is operational, is to essentially review data every single year uh, to see how effective whatever the, the sorting process was. Uh, and make adaptive management decisions to be able to update that for the next year so that we can integrate uh, gradual improvements over the 10-year lifespan of the project. Now, because Fish Pass isn't constructed yet, uh, what one thing that the advisory board has focused on recently is kind of supplementary research, which is really just being able to capture innovative solutions that we can apply to Fish Pass once it comes online. And today, I'm just going to focus on just two uh, quick snippets of some projects. One is developing an unautonomous fish identification system, and the other one is the first phase of a project geared towards near real-time flow and fish tracking. So for the sorting process, or the sorting tool, uh, I don't know if, if any of you are familiar with the Woosh Salmon Cannon. Um, if you're not familiar with it, just YouTube it, you'll get a kick out of it. Essentially, it's a big wetted tube that uh, is used out west to be able to pass salmon over these really large dams. Um, now, that's not what we're proposing here because we don't really have those large dams, but what they, that same company, so Wush Innovations, has is this imaging hood. So we collected a lot of images of uh, uh, Great Lakes fish, both invasive and native, um, using that tool uh, a few years ago, and then worked with a team of researchers at Central Michigan University to essentially develop a computer learning algorithm that's able to take the images that this box takes. So fish just slide through it, it takes about 18 images pretty much instantaneously. Uh, and then the computer program can identify it as either sam sea lamprey or not. Uh, and early results are really promising that it was over 99% effective at identifying sea lamprey from a, a large suite of uh, other fin fish. Um, the one problem with this and, and why it works really well is it dewaters. You have to dewater the fish. So they slide down individually. You don't have to deal with difficulties of imaging fish underwater where there might be multiple fish or turbidity causes issues. Um, so that presents another challenge of just how do we get fish into there? And that's where we use a technology that's really old. So this Archimedes screw is what we envision might be used to be able to lift fish into the system. And we did some preliminary tests in, uh, in the Sheboygan River in 2021. And you can kind of see here that it's a very simple tool. It dates back to kind of uh, ancient Greece. And we were able to safely and effectively and quickly pass, lift uh, 700 suckers in the span of a, about a week. Uh, and that was just implemented at a sea lamprey trap. Um, so we still have a lot of work to go to, to, to implementing this in a kind of non-constrained uh, portion and, and still kind of connect these two pieces. But you can see this is a tool that uh, has a lot of promise and uh, potential for use at fish passage or fish pass. So the other project that I, I'll mention here is the kind of near real-time flow and, and fish tracking system. So Ideally, what we, what we know is fish will respond to turbulence and just specific types of flow in, in, the, in the rivers in somewhat predictable ways. Um, and what we want to be able to do is be able to quantify those flow fields in real time while we're also tracking fish so that we can manipulate flows and effectively guide fish through a maze 
uh, especially those that are desirable versus non-desirable. Um, and really just the first, first phase of this project is being able to just document what's going on at the water surface. How is the water actually moving? So this uses a tool called Infrared Quantitative Image Velocimetry, or IRQID. It's a really complicated way of just saying you're taking pictures of the temperature of the water. Uh, and this is developed by researchers at Cornell University. Uh, and essentially what this does is it uses infrared images. So you can see this, this heat map here. So the yellow colors that like you see here, that's warmer water. And the dark blue colors are colder water. And these are just really infinitesimally small differences in water temperature that are uh, kind of affected towards the water surface because of turbulence below the water surface. And you can kind of see as these kind of track downstream, we can use a computer program to essentially track those pixels and then be able to then recreate what the water flow field is. And if we extract kind of just mean flow, because we know the water is generally moving from left to right, we get something that looks like this, which is the velocity fluctuation. So these are the turbulent structures that are generated in the river at a really broad scale. So this is on the order of 20 or 20, I think it's about maybe 40 by 20 meters um, is that, that rectangle. And we know these are the coherent structures. So these are the eddies that, that form in the river. You can kind of see them slowly rotate as they move through. And fish, we know, respond to those uh, because it, it's indicators of different obstacles up ahead or confluences of, of streams. Uh, so being able to document this at really broad scale at near real time conditions is a, is a promising tool that we can use at Fish Pass. And we do plan to use it uh, at the entrance pad because this is that, that first location where we can start to uh, sort fish because of how, how much flow is going down either the fish sorting channel or, or the uh, bypass channel. So kind of switching gears back to uh, how we're actually gonna assess the project. Um, we really have an assessment plan. I, I welcome you, you can always check it out at, at the Fish Pass website. Um, but essentially what the plan has two priorities. And one is to be able to assess how effective these fish sorting and passage techniques and technologies are. And to be able to do that, we need to be able to assess what's the baseline condition of the fish community and uh, sizes of fish runs in the system. Uh, the other priority that we'll work on as the project continues is the consequences of fish passage. Um, because at this point, we don't really know how many fish we need to pass to reach specific fish community goals for the Borden River. So this will help us establish kind of what's the baseline conditions both up and downstream. And then as we progress through the project and we release more and more fish, what kind of impacts are, are those having? And being able to do that allows us to achieve that third objective, which is being able to set the solutions of fish pass uh, in a global context so that the approach can be exported to different locations. So as I mentioned, we do have a lot of uh, baseline assessment that's going on. Um, the first one that I'll, I'll talk about here is our uh, quarterly fish sampling. So we go out and sample fish in the river four times a year, just kind of get a snapshot of what the fish community is. Uh, and we've had that going on now for the last four years. And while we're doing that, we also do take the opportunity to be able to tag fish. So this is an example where we're implanting a pit tag, which is a passive integrated transponder. It's essentially a small microchip. It's the same technology that's used to microchip your uh, dog or cat at the vet. Um, but instead of relying on a wand to be able to identify the fish, fish are gonna move through these antennas, which are really simple structures. They're just a, basically a loop of wire. And as the fish passes through that, we're able to identify the fish because they each have a unique code. And we can also timestamp when they reach that antenna. And because we have a system of these antennas located throughout the river, uh, and we've tagged now, I think, just north of a thousand fish of multiple different species in the Borden River, we start to get a snapshot of how these fish are, are entering and exiting the system throughout the year. So this is kind of getting the, that question of what's the phenology of fish movement in the Borden River. And you can kind of see here, I don't expect you to see what individual species are, but you can see there's a lot of overlap in the movement time, but the durations do kind of vary. And we have like common white sucker have a really protracted presence in the river that's might be uh, modified by a few that stayed resident um, versus sea lamprey kind of fall in the middle of pretty much all the, all the other species here. So that again, uh, highlights that uh, condition where they overlap in their runtime with a lot of our native species. Um, as part of that project, or in addition to that project, we also are working with uh, researchers from another group from Cornell uh, to be able to look at energy and nutrient dynamics in the Borden River. So this is looking at uh, nutrients derived from the Great Lakes are moving in with those migrant species. 
our migrant fish and seeing you know, what kind of contribution that has to energy and, and production upstream. Uh, and one of the and the two species that we're primarily focused on with that project are the long nose and white suckers. So uh, last year, to be able to quantify just how many of these fish actually run into the system, we uh, used the Michigan DNR uh, salmon weir, which is located downstream of the Union Street Dam, and put in these uh, fabricated uh, uh, traps to be able to collect long nose and white suckers as they moved into the system. You can see we, we collected about 2,500 long nose sucker and, and just around 500 white suckers. We were able to take those and resample them as they move both up and downstream. Uh, and we got uh, an estimate of their run size of roughly about 30,000 fish uh, will enter this system on a given year. So if you imagine, if you're even passing 10% of that, that's a lot of fish. Um, and, and those are fish that have not been able to make it upstream over the last 100 years. Now, what's interesting while we were doing that, we also encountered a fairly uh, unexpected situation in which we had hundreds of thousands of alewives move into the Borman River. Uh, it was so thick you could kind of walk across the river and seemed like. Um, obviously, this is not a native species to the Great Lakes, and just their sheer numbers and propensity to die when looked at wrong, uh, they do just impose a kind of an operational constraint to fish pass as we move along in the future, but it's not an every year occurrence. Um, so finally, the last assessment project I'll talk about is kind of our, our larger scale telemetry project. This is tracking fish movement, not only within the Borden River, but out into Grand Traverse Bay and out into Lake Michigan proper. So we've, tra so we've implanted acoustic tanks. So these are our transmitters that are put into the body of the fish and it sends out pings every, uh, uh, they all have different kind of rates at which they, they set up those pings, but those are, are picked up by uh, an array of receivers around Grand Traverse Bay, but any receiver that's located within the Great Lakes can also pick these up and we'll, we'll be able to find them. So we tagged steelhead, smallmouth bass, common white suckers, longnose suckers, lake trout, and one lone lake sturgeon that came into the river uh, last year. Uh, this project started in 2002, so we this last year was the, the, or we started getting our first year of returns in 2022, um, and I'll show you some of the kind of interesting data we've found from this. The first one is, so these are some uh, rainbow, head, rainbow trout steelhead. Uh, you can see the yellow dots are the fish, are fish that are, uh, those are kind of interpolated paths as they exited the Borman River. And the blue dots are when those fish actually get picked up by an individual receiver. And you can see that we have a few that even make it all the way over to Green Bay, Bay to Knock. Uh, we had one steelhead that was caught down in Milwaukee. We've had others that have completely left the system, gone into Lake Huron, and we see, very similar patterns with lake trout. Uh, again, if you think about that kind of nutrient pool idea, these are fish that are going out in the lake. They're collecting nutrients and in some cases even contaminants out in the lake. And those can potentially be brought back into the Borden River. Um, in, in the case of nutrients, that's energy that can be released in, in feces or eggs that then fish upstream that don't leave the system can, can utilize. Um, but also you have that, that trade-off with contaminants might also be loaded in with so kind of taking a step back, where's the project at? Um, as of 2020, we had completed our, our full design and planning stages. The project went out to bid uh, and was awarded by the Army Corps of Engineers to a local contractor uh, to, to just around $20 million. Uh, we had a groundbreaking ceremony kind of mid-COVID time, so we have proper spacing, face masks, and shovels on a dam during its highest water level that I've ever seen. Um, but sadly, just before uh, the contractor was actually going to start work, uh, a citizen of Traverse City decided to sue the city over alleged disposal of parkland. So we've been uh, dealing with that, uh, the judicial process ever since. But we are hopeful that uh, it's on its last legs and we'll be able to start construction uh, either mid to late this year. Uh, we're, we tentatively have a schedule that we'd like to be able to uh, we think there'd be a final decision on the le on the legal case uh, so that construction could start uh, as soon as July. Um, but once that starts, it is anticipated a two-year construction period uh, in which it'll be operational in kind of mid to late 2025. And that will start a 10-year, a planned 10-year optimization phase where we'll develop those different sorting tools, integrate them in different fashions, um, and hopefully be able to export those solutions to other barriers. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. It looks like we have some time. Uh, 
Question. Let me get some lights on here. Pretty involved, eh? Could you just go through briefly again how you're going to separate the styrofoams from the undesirables? Yep. Let's see if I can get back to this. So essentially what we want to be able to do is kind of a, a process in which we target those, those specific attributes. So if you say you want to sort out, uh, as an example, let's see here, uh, some larger body fish, like say a northern pike from steel from white suckers or long nose suckers or even sea lamprey, a way to do that because of size differences, you can use grains to be able to separate out large, large individuals from smaller individuals. Um, but we're relying on much more than just a single tool to be able to do this. So it's really the idea of using all these different tools, whether it be uh, seasonal operation, uh, trapping based on size or, or swimming position within the water column, specific responses to environmental cues. So playing um, loud noises underwater can deter fish that have specialized hearing. Um, or it can be used to effectively guide them to one side of the channel versus the other. And the same thing can be said with like the alarm cue. And it's essentially putting all of those pieces uh, in, in a lot of different orders and configurations uh, will eventually sort the fish out. So we don't know exactly what that final configuration is. Um, it may just be the same three tools used multiple times to effectively weed out all the undesirable fish. What are you going to do with the undesirable? <laughs> Uh, so, so in this case, it really depends on what the species is. If if it's a sea lamprey, we more or less plan to trap them and remove them. That's that's done throughout the Great Lakes Basin. There's traps uh, that collect sea lamprey at a lot of dams. They're used for scientific purposes or just euthanized. Um, uh, when it comes to all the other undesirable fish, so because we're focused on passage of species that are native to the other Great Lakes, certainly if we block steelhead, essentially we're just blocking them. It'd be no different to the existing dam in which they hit a dam, they can either stay or leave and go to a different tributary system. So they may not necessarily be removed. Other question? Ed. This is a trite question. Did you tag the surgeon and how far he, did he travel back? Yes, we did take the surgeon. Um, because it's one fish, it wasn't a terribly exciting image. Right. Uh, but essentially, it spent about a year and a half just in, in uh, East and West Bay. It just kind of bounced between uh, the two bays uh, outside the river. Uh, and then I believe it was this, just this winter, it took off towards Lake Huron. So we haven't seen it return yet. Um, obviously, it's a very short run between the dam and the Great Lake. So they're certainly not trying, they're not spawning in the river right now. Um, but that's why we have it tagged, and ho hopefully we'll see it come back. Okay, thank you. Yeah. How does this system compare to what's being done at the Illinois border, or the, the Illinois waters into the Great Lakes? So that system is entirely a deterrent. So there's no passage of native fish. It's primarily set up to just block uh, silver and big head carp at all costs. Um, that That's a field where I, previous to coming to the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, I did a lot of research on silver and big head carp and using uh, hydraulics and sound to be able to deter them. Um, so that system is primarily, it's just trying to block it while still allowing the water to pass. So that's that kind of how it differentiates. So if the carp would get into the Great Lakes, what would be the best methods to try and get rid of them? Would it be a combination of these or is that still undetermined? So, so when it comes to the the invasive carps, um, if they were to make it to the Borden River and fish pass, um, our plans on whether how to pass them or, or block them um, is kind of the, the least of our worries. I, I kind of see it because once they've established in the Great Lakes, it'd be very difficult to uh, eliminate them, similar to how sea lamprey are, are still uh, a presence. Um, but certainly, you know, silver and big egg carp have a lot of commonalities with common carp which we do have in the system. So if you have tools that can effectively sort out common carp, um, it's not that much of a stretch to assume that those might be effective solutions for uh, those similar species. What's the nutritional value of a sea lamprey? Couldn't that be turned into cat food or fertilizer or something? Um, 
I don't know about the nutritional value. I know in their native range, they are a delicacy in England. I think the Great Lakes Fish Commission has even provided some sea lamprey for sea lamprey pie for the queen. I do so annually or biannually. Um, however, I, I wouldn't recommend eating them because they're really at the top of the food chain and they feed on the blood of top predators. So they accumulate a lot of uh, contaminants. So like mercury, they're really high in mercury. Um, so that kind of limits the potential uh, feeding uses of, yeah, of even for animal feed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> After you remove Union Street Dam, you still have one more on the plumbing board in Lake, don't you? No, no. So, uh, go back to the map here. Uh, so, you can't really see it too well in this map, but essentially, so. This is a former impoundment, it's no longer there. This is also, for, these are both former impoundments that are not there. This is, this darker water by here, that is Union, that is the Fordman Lake. It is a naturally occurring uh, lake. However, the dam at Union Street does provide about an additional six to seven feet of head. So Fish Pass is not going to change the hydraulics downstream. Um, so it essentially will maintain uh, Boardman Lake at its current level. Uh, and will actually probably prevent it from uh, having water fluctuations more than the current system does because it's just a more effective way to pass water. So your criteria for success, um, will it be more the purity of what you pass instead of a number? You know what I mean? Yep. And if you only pass, say, 10% of the desirable fish, but it's all desirable fish. Mm -hmm. That may be uh, I mean, the purity may be more important than the quantity. Yes, and in this case, that that is kind of how we view, it. and that's why the like the biological goals is no passage of sea lamprey and some unknown amount of native fish passage because we don't know what's needed for each system. Um, but if you view it from the standpoint of if you can provide ten percent of passage of native species with high certainty that you're not allowing sea lamprey passage in this river and then can take a similar system on other dams across the Great Lakes. That accumulates to quite a lot of fish now being able to gain access to spawning habitat that was previously blocked and unattainable. So it may not be you know, passing 90% of our suckers, but even 10% of that 30,000 is still a large number of fish that are making it upstream and potentially contributing to the fishery production upstream. Having grown up there, how susceptible are these systems to ice damage and uh, ice shoves? Uh, this system was selected for a couple of reasons. One, it's incredibly stable. You saw from the, the flow, flow records and also the fact that the lower river has not frozen in as far as anybody we know. <laughs> Um, the Borman Lake will freeze over, but the river below that has not frozen over. And essentially the structure that we have here, uh, it's a concrete weir. Um, so it's it's fairly stable. It's It'll be anchored in with, with really deep sheet piling. It's it's pretty stable and it's designed against a certain amount of ice loading, but we don't anticipate being a really large issue, uh, at least in the system. Is the return of the good fish over that labyrinth that you had, or is it a different way? The return? Yeah. Oh, so so the return. Uh, so what we what I didn't focus on here is the labyrinth weir really only activates. So water is only going to pass over that essentially under flood conditions. But water will always be going over what we're calling the low flow weir, which is basically a, a one foot deep notch that's cut out that has a slow ramp on the downstream end. Um, it's designed so that fish can't make it upstream, but they can pass. Downstream. So we envision downstream passage is going to affect, happen over that or back through the fish sorting channel. Um, and, and I focused all this talk on upstream movement, acknowledging the fact that a lot of berries also impact downstream movement of, of larvae or whatever is being uh, moved upstream. So that is something we, we do plan to investigate as the project moves on. It's just we're, we're starting with upstream movement because we know that's zero right now. So what if you find fish that you don't want to pass? Keep trying to go through. I mean, um, you know, like steelhead may aggregate, but they may also get kicked out over and over and over again. I mean, that's 
that's yep. just something you got to plan around, right? Yes. Yep. Um, I mean, it, it may it may, <laughs> it, it may entail collection and, and relocating them further downstream. There is I, I didn't mention here. There is a, a small tributary that we do know um, Steelhead Coho and Chinook do actually go up. Um, it's about a half a mile downstream of this. It's the only other tributary on, on the Borden River below the dam. So there are other options for for fish like steelhead that we would be blocking. Um, but essentially it's no different than the current condition. Um, and it's just a challenge we're gonna have to deal with because they're gonna, they're not gonna just try pass it once and then fall back. They will try multiple times. And that's, the system has to be uh, robust enough to be able to handle not only the, the individual passages, but the repeated attempts. Do you have to have it manned or can it be automated or do you always need somebody there just to make sure it's full? <laughs> The idea is that the the kind of overall goal is that fish are essentially sorting themselves. So through that interaction with all those different tools and te technologies, they're guiding themselves through in ways that we're kind of directing them um, so that it is unmanned. Now, long term, you probably still have to have some check-in on the system, but we want to minimize that as much as possible because really, if you have to have somebody there all the time checking traps, it's really no different than manual trapping the sorter. <laughs> Are there any questions from Zoom? If there are, just unmute yourself and ask it. Are you going to ask a question? Yeah, why are you trying to block steelhead and salmon? Thank you, Juan. Yeah, if, if this was on any other system, that probably wouldn't even be a question we'd be passing. I mean, we think, and that's quite frankly one of the most difficult things to be able to do is prevent them from passing. Um, but because this system, there's a strong uh, drive from the community um, and the DNR and tribe both support it as well, is to protect the upstream watershed for as long as possible. Um, just because you've had three dams being removed, it's going to take that system uh, to reach kind of equilibrium um, with the fish species that are already resident, you know, probably five to 10 years at least. Um, so they, the plan is essentially during this kind of research phase while we have that kind of control, just not have any passage of non-native species to begin with. So is this an area where the salmon will actually reproduce by themselves if they get upstream? They probably could. Um, certainly we have brook and brown trout that spawn naturally upstream, so it wouldn't be too much of a stretch to say that steelhead would be able to. Um, now when it comes to coho and chinook, the DNR does run a weir on this river downstream of Union Street that pulls coho and chinook out for egg take. So they, they wouldn't effectively be passed, but steelhead is really the last remaining question. And, and decisions on what eventually gets passed is not up to the Great Lakes Fisher Commission or Fish Pass. Essentially, what we're providing is the tool so that the DNR, in consultation with the tribe and public, can make those decisions a reality. Can you show the simulation one more time? Yep. Just getting to Joan's question, exactly how you're going to do it. So it, you see the different shape and colors of fish over the whole time sort of separate out. And yep. conceptually, you know, it, it does it by size. You see some of the sea lamprey right underneath. Yep. It, by shape or color, it opens up those doors and every step it's going to weed something out and you do it enough and you get down to what you want. That yeah. Is, you're like cannon for gold. Yeah. Cause it, it's one of those things where like, I, I'm, you know, I won't get into all the details, but a lot of these systems have been tested on individual species in very specific locations. And generally what you find, especially with a lot of the uh, non-physical deterrence or guidance technology. So that's light sound, turbulence, uh, bubbles, they all max out at around like 75% effective in terms of guiding the fish you want to go in, one, one in a specific direction. And if you think about if it's 70% effective on one try and you have another tool that's 70% 70, 70 effective of what just made it through, you get that kind of attrition as you move through the system that there's going to be fewer and fewer of those non-desirable species making it up. And if your kind of backstop is that image recognition tool, now it only needs to pick out one undesirable fish out of every 200 fish that it passes. And it keeps a image record of every single fish that it sees. So it gives you a way to kind of back up and see, all right, how many fish are passing? 
Um, they also get really good information on the length, size of every single fish that's passed. And then you can also identify all the fish that, oh, it didn't pass this one. Um, but it's not a perfect solution. I mean, if we rely on a computer to do this all, nine times out of 10, it probably works great. But there's still that, you know, it's never 100% effective. So if you reduce the amount of species or fish that it has to catch, you're reducing that risk more and more. So that's kind of how we view it as, you know, it's a, a recursive situation where you, you just kind of repeatedly sort the fish until you get down to the point where you're, you're really sure, uh, and especially during the research phase, you know, we'll be able to quantify just how sure we are of each individual that's being passed through each tool. So if you do it recursively, you're slowly just weeding out the, those, those non-desirables. You have a chat on Zoom, maybe, oh. unless somebody is saying bye. Okay. Yep. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. That's a good question. So, Rob, did you have one? Dan, um, maybe you can share with the group. There's been a lot of research done with lamprey and their behavior that, because that's, that's really kind of the whole trail that you be able to get the lamprey separate from a lot yep. of the other fish. I think people might be interested in it. You know, there's just a lot of things people have figured out that help that lamprey do the other fish don't that that may be tested here. Um referring to oh, there's a whole bunch of things, but there are some. Yeah, yeah. So so like the alarm cue is just one example on uh, kind of on the flip side. Um researchers also know that uh lamprey really hone in on tributaries based on pheromones that are released by larvae um, or other lamprey that are in that system. That's how they identify like, well, we know there's, I know there's good spawning habitat there because I'm getting a signal of their spawning that's happened. So that's how they find those tributaries. They don't necessarily home to, you know, their, their natal range. They spread throughout the lake, they're attached to other fish, and they just go to the nearest tributary that has the best quality habitat. Um, and people have identified what those pheromones are and are working on isolating the specific compounds they're responding to. Um, so that's kind of another way you can apply these naturally occurring chemicals to be able to attract sea lamprey as opposed to deter them in the sense that the alarm cue is working. Um, we also know that unlike every other uh, fin fish in the Great Lakes, sea lamprey will attach to surfaces. So we have researchers at uh, Michigan State University that are developing these smart sensors that, that can essentially detect when a sea lamprey attaches to it. So that might trigger some some other response like an electrocution to be able to shock them so they have to swim or it triggers a trap to occur. But essentially that's another tool that we're using because sea lamprey have that rather peculiar behavior being able to attach that other fish don't. And then finally, you know, the last example is still that, that eel style ladder in which sea lamprey, as long as there's a little bit of water running through that, are able to make it up that, whereas all the other fin fish in the Great Lakes don't. So those are great tools that specifically target sea lamprey because of those unique uh, attributes. And in that lower right-hand corner, there's just a little bit of water going through there. When you get up to the top, they kind of fall in a hole and yes. they're gone, right? Yep, they fall into a drain. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's kind of like climbing up through rocks and stuff like that. And they're the only ones that can do that, but they want to go that way too, right? They're sort of attracted there or maybe not? Somewhat, that's the problem is you can get them to climb it, really effectively trying to convince them to actually try to climb it is is the difficulty. That's where all these tools work just to varying extents. And then if you had a sea lamprey attached to a sucker and fish pass, it would be an image recognition aspect the, there. There that could potentially be targeted with the image recognition tool, but um and, and I get this question pretty much every time I talk about what happens if a sea lamprey is attached to some other fish? Um, and it, it, to answer that, you kind of have to go back to the life history of sea lamprey. Essentially, if they're attached to a fish, they're feeding and they have not matured to be able to spawn. So they're not actively trying to spawn, they're feeding. Um, once they cease feeding on fish and then try to go spawn, that's when that maturation process happens. That's when they can actually express gametes. Um, it's not happening while they're feeding on fish. So although it does happen, and there's, I know you can look online, you can see a photo of a sea lamprey attached to a steelhead jumping over a barrier, um, but they're not at that life history, that point in their life that they're trying to spawn. So even though it could happen, it's it's uh, a low risk that happens at pretty much every sea lamprey barrier there is. 
Um, and quite frankly, at least in the Borden River system, probably more likely someone's going to grab a lamprey and throw it over the system versus one attached to a fish, making it upstream, finding a mate, and then spawning. Uh, so it could happen, um, but the risk of it leading to a kind of recruiting class of sea lamprey is, is low. The otters will get that one that gets up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, well, reckons. <laughs> yeah. So construction starts this summer. Hopefully this summer, yes. For two years? Two years, yep. And then how many years after that before you make more um, final decisions are made and stuff like that? At least 10 years. So we're 12 years off. Well, we'll have and findings at throughout the process. Right. I mean, we we all all the people involved in this project are we want to make this as broadly visible as possible. So as we find just find things that work well or don't work, um, those will be published and you know information will be released as quickly as we can. Um, and that's really the intent. We want to be as inclusive of who's doing research and what research is going on because just outside of you know the goal of selectively passing fish at Fish Pass, um, this is a really unique facility that has opportunities for a lot of fields of research that you know, we want to be able to accommodate. Or ones that are come, or people have ideas for sorting processes that we have no idea of, and this is where it can be developed. So all those things will be occurring throughout the life of the process. It's just that right now we plan on having that optimization phase of being at least 10 years. I guess that at least 10 years. So I mean, like you said, this is maybe the only place some of this research yes. is done. So 10 years from now, there's a whole bunch of stuff that people still want to learn. Yep. This could still be a place to test it. Exactly. And, and certainly that even if we, even in, in the ideal situation where we come up with the perfect solution for the Boardman River fish community after 10 years, there's still the process of assessing how well it's working what kind of changes happen in the system. Because again, like it comes down to the question of, well, how many fish do you need to pass to be effective? Um, and that's going to differ by each system. Um, and that takes many years of, of uh, assessment of the system and what those changes occur over time. And it may be in recruitment classes, size classes, uh, different fish making it upstream that haven't been there before. Um, just a lot of things go into that. So it, it, research is certainly not going to stop right at that 10-year point. Right. What kind of problems do you think you'll have with the quagga mussels and the zebra mussels in that system? Uh, well, we we already know that there are zebra mussels further upstream. There were they were found in some of the uh, impoundments, um, but in the river itself, you know that they're certainly present. Um, we have an ample plan for operation and maintenance to be able to deal with that because that's going to be a real issue in a lot of different areas too. Um, it's not unique to the Borden River. So that's something we're just going to have to have face kind of as a maintenance challenge that we really don't, I, I don't know how much of a problem or not a problem it's going to be. So just from a perspective uh, issue, when both Rob and I worked on the Borden a little bit, but I remember when they took the, the very first dam out, the Brown Bridge. Yep. And then uh, actually the secretary, or no, the, the, the head of the Fish and Wildlife Service came out to sort of uh, celebrate it. And, and I wasn't exactly sure what he was going to say, but he actually said, well, here, here the Boardman River has spent the last 90 years producing electricity for the community. And that's a valuable commodity. But now that that dam is out, now it can convert back to what it was and continue to um, um, benefit the community just in a different way, in a more natural way. Yes. Um, and so on. So um, you think about the Menominee River, you know, what if none of those dams are on the Menominee and sturgeon would be able to run up to all the natural barriers and stuff? How much more stream would be available for sturgeon to reproduce themselves? And what, what is the ultimate value of that? You know, well, you know, if you have all the ways of producing electricity, then it becomes attractive, right? Mm -hmm. The other thing I'll say is, if you ever doubt that the Fishery Commission isn't trying to look at every little thing to control sea lampreys and produce a good fishery, this is a great example of the lengths that they'll go to uh, to be all on cutting edge uh, to make that happen. 
So any other questions? So let's give them another round. Of